Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you could please take your seats. We are going to get proceedings underway. A very, very warm welcome uh, to the Stockholm Plus 50 edition of the United Nations Science Policy Business Forum on the Environment. My name is Axel Threlfall. I'm editor-at-large at Reuters, based out of London. I'll be your host over the next uh, couple of days. I am truly thrilled to be back at this event in person uh, and proud to be associated uh, with the work of this fast-growing uh, community since the inception of the forum back in December uh, 2017. Since then, the forum has convened around the world and virtually too, shaping processes, informing key ministerial decisions, launching global member state-led alliances such as the Big Data for the Environment Alliance, and we've worked towards policies that empower technology innovation and integrated solutions for nature. But the work of this community is, as you all know, just beginning. We convene here this week in the context of Stockholm Plus 50, the UN event that commemorates 50 years since the Stockholm conference that gave birth to environmental multilateralism. During that half century, we witnessed the sobering reality of a planet in peril where the impacts of climate change, biodiversity loss, ecosystem deterioration, and pollution adversely and mercilessly impacted and continue to impact our livelihoods, health, economy, security, and our very survival. But we are not where we need to be. The science is crystal clear on this. So over the next few days, we plan to undertake a realistic examination of the systems, the, the, the building blocks, if you like, that we have in place, and consider how those systems uh, need to change, be adapted, be scrapped, and done over, perhaps, uh, to get us where we so desperately need to be. To do this, we need to ask the hard questions. We need to seek answers, to speak truth to power. Many of you have heard me say this uh, time uh, and time again. Important conversations are happening. We are seeing new levels of collaboration among the business, finance, and policy-making communities within and between sectors and countries, but this is just a start. So your discussions over the next few days will inform the UN system at large. Uh, they'll provide a much-needed multi-sectoral perspective to the work of the UN Environment Assembly, the world's highest level uh, decision-making body on the environment. Uh, so our work is uh, cut out for us, and I do uh, want this to be uh, a fun, interactive uh, couple of days. I'll, I'll get your participation as much as I can if you have questions. Uh, do save them. There's going to be roving microphones, uh, and you'll have uh, plenty of time to have your say. Uh, enough from me uh, for now. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to give the floor to the head of the Global Secretariat of the UN Science Policy Business Forum, Shireen Zorba, to share the vision and the expectations for the coming days. Shireen. Excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's a special moment to be here this morning after two and a half years of lockdown, to see you again in person, to meet old friends and to make new ones. Thank you for being here, for your commitment and determination to put in the work and to make a difference. We are truly honored to have amongst us leaders from science and technology, policy, diplomacy, and society. Yet, the most important stakeholders in this room, I would argue, are those whose future is most impacted by the actions of today. The young people of the world who will bring to our deliberations their vision of the future they want. So we are very pleased to host a delegation of young people um, and to have them uh, very seriously share their views, share their vision, and also critique, perhaps, the performance of our generation. And this was very important to us as we co-designed the fourth global session of the forum in Stockholm to ensure we work closely with youth champions and to have them present. 
because while the world marks the conclusion of 50 years of environmental multilateralism, the UN Science Policy Business Forum is really here to mark the beginning of the next 50 years. We are here to co-design, uh, to co-create a vision for Stockholm Plus 100 and the actions that will take us there. It is the younger generation who will live with the decisions we make today. And it is to them that we are most accountable. Looking back, the past 50 years delivered all the science we need for us to understand our impact on the only planet we have. This understanding, this awareness the science made possible resulted in a desire to do the right thing, to make things better, to fix what we broke. So we made promises, pledges, multilateral agreements, some voluntary and others legally binding, that we broke. So we need to do better. Over the coming sessions, we will answer in myriad ways one question how to make international commitments translate into real transformation. In other words, how to bridge the implementation gap between commitments and action. What are the technologies that will take us there, the policies that will empower, and the resources that will finance, and how to do all that in the most equitable and just way possible. Our work here and beyond will inform the UN's highest level decision-making body on the environment, like Axel just said, the UN Environment Assembly. It would also inform the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, whose president will be with us shortly. But it will also empower and help chart a path within the important and diverse institutions each of us represents. It is my pleasure to now invite Sonja leeton Cohn. Deputy Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme to take the floor. Thank you, Shireen, and good morning, friends. Glasses would help. <laughs> I'm honored and excited to be here in Stockholm speaking to you. 50 years ago, world leaders came together in this city for the UN Conference on the Human Environment. Even then, there was a growing understanding that human health and development are deeply intertwined with protecting the environment. We knew that we depended on Earth's resources for our survival and economic growth. We agreed then that we had a shared responsibility to create pathways to development that would safeguard natural resources for future generations. Nowhere was this expressed more memorably than in the 1972 Stockholm Declaration and Action Plan, and allow me to remind us. It said, in quote, we are both creatures and molders of our environment. Our capability to transform our surroundings, if used wisely, can bring to all peoples in the benefits of development. But through ignorance or indifference, we can do massive and irreversible harm to the environment, end quote. Can you imagine, 50 years on, these words still hold us to account. Have we paid them heed? On the one hand, we could say yes. Since 1972, through multilateral policies and action, we have made gains for the planet such as repairing the ozone layer, stopping production of leaded petrol, both of which are saving millions of lives every year. But on the other hand, we have, and still are, 
doing massive harm to the environment. Our past growth have relied heavily on fossil fuels. We have extracted, transformed, used and thrown away Earth's resources without replenishing them. We are using the equivalent of 1.7 Earths to maintain our current way of life, and the planet cannot keep up with our demands. This has led to a triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss, pollution and waste, which is undermining our efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals. But now is not the time to lament our failures. Now is the time to act. The shared responsibility we recognized in 1972 is even more urgent now. This high-level global session of the UN Science Policy Business Forum on the Environment brings together a truly remarkable community of leaders from business, industry, finance, science, policy, and civil society. I'm pleased to see that the agenda includes topics like bridging the imp implementation gap, financing our SDGs, managing harmful subsidies, energy transition, and technology. These are exactly the kinds of issues we need to discuss. And as you deliberate, I'd encourage you to think about the following. What policy frameworks, financing mechanisms, and incentives need to be put in place to transform sectors and drive truly the energy transition? How can we accelerate the shift to circular and regenerative economies? The COVID-19 pandemic has dev had had devastating economic impacts, but it has also ushered in a digital revolution how can businesses and governments leverage this to create broad-based growth and green jobs? The task ahead is certainly not easy. In fact, there are no easy solutions to the triple planetary crisis. All will require social, economic, and technological changes, major ones, and investment. But with political will, multilateral action and continued innovation, I'm confident that we will come closer to the right pathways. I'd like to leave you with some inspiring words once again from the 1972 Stockholm Declaration. Remember, it is people that propel social progress, develop science and technology, and through their hard work, transform the human environment. Thank you, and I wish you good consultations. I need help. I'm terrified of stepping. <laughs> you okay? Here we go. Here we go. Very good. Uh, uh, Sonja, thank you very much indeed. And, and we will, by the way, we will have some frank discussions about the role of UNEP. Um, you know, whether it has the resources it needs, et cetera, et cetera, a little later on uh, in the day. Um, ladies and gentlemen, a, a word of welcome now from His Excellency Abdullah Shahid, President of the UN uh, General Assembly. Excellencies, dear friends, I'm honored to contribute to this fourth global session of the United Nations Science Policy Business Forum on the Environment. I congratulate the organizers of this initiative, convened in support of the UN Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. Today's gathering demonstrates the value of interconnectedness and the fundamental nexus between science, policy, business, civil society, and the UN agencies in tackling global challenges. Science, in particular, remains a fundamental tool in the achievement of sustainable development goals, including those directly and indirectly linked to the environment. To reimagine multilateralism and its role in promoting and preserving the environment, we must leverage the approaches and solutions availed by science and technology. But to do so, we need to set in place 
the right policies and conditions. And I believe this forum is uniquely placed to set the right tone to do that. My friends, science is a cause of hope and optimism for humanity in these challenging times. But we cannot overlook the many barriers that we need to overcome before the enormous opportunities can be realized. These include the lack of basic infrastructure, insufficient data access, and inadequate policy and governance systems to support development. We need to create empowering conditions for all, especially developing and least developed countries who have disproportionately suffered the impacts of the pandemic. It is these countries that need access to the best and most sustainable technologies. This is why this coalition of science, policy, business and finance is important to ensure environmental responses and policies are both inclusive and equitable. My friends, the scale of transformation needed to tackle the three planetary crises, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution is only possible with collective action. Stockholm Plus 50 is an incredible opportunity for all of us to forge lasting coalitions and foster genuine partnerships to achieve the global environment agenda. It is my strong belief that platforms like these afford the use of, for us to make the ability to reach out to multiple networks, to municipalities and governments and to private sector partners to inspire many more to join these efforts. Dear friends, climate change, unchecked resource consumption and pollution are some of the most pressing issues facing us today. And businesses are critical to reversing these trends. When businesses lead with purpose, they positively impact both the planet as well as business financials. While it is understandable that transitioning to greener production practices are complex and require deeper research into the environmental and human impact across an entire supply chain or materials life cycle, we only have one planet to live in. The choice is clear. We need nothing less than a transformation. Today, consumers increasingly believe that they have a responsibility to purchase products that are good for the environment and society. There are many studies that point out that corporate initiatives aimed at improving environmental and social and governance performance can actually increase productivity, efficiency, and staff retention. In other words, sustainable business practices are turning mainstream. We need businesses that can redefine the corporate ecosystem businesses that not only create, but add value for all stakeholders involved. Markets need to go carbon neutral and eventually turn carbon negative. Investing in sustainability can drive innovation. Dear friends, rest assured I will continue to do my best to spur momentum alongside with you. In July, I will convene a moment for nature that will enable UN member states and stakeholders to reflect on the outcomes of the various summit level events on the environment held during the 76th session. The high level thematic debate will also provide the much needed political momentum for enhanced climate action on the ground. Let us continue to forge a sustainable path forward with equitable access to solutions for all. I look forward to taking this journey together with you and wish this forum every success. I thank you. Abdullah uh, Shahid, President of the uh, General Assembly. Uh, the UN Economic and Social Council, or ECOSOC, uh, is one of the six principal organs of the UN, and I think fair to say is the uh, custodian uh, if you like, of the SDGs. His Excellency Colleen Vixen Kelapile is president uh, of ECOSOC, and I'm thrilled to welcome him to the stage now, Your Excellency.
thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. Th thank you very much, uh, moderator. First, let me apologize for keeping you waiting. I just came straight from the airport. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored to join you today as co-host for the fourth global session of the UN Science Policy Business Forum on the environment during this Stockholm Plus 50, a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, our responsibility, our opportunity. Half a century has elapsed since our countries gathered here in Stockholm to reflect on human interactions with the environment. Today, we need to honestly assess how far we have gone in our aspirations to live a balanced life in harmony with nature. And science and technology can and should assist us in our evidence-based assessment. We should remind ourselves that only a few days ago, on 27th May, we also celebrated the birthday of American scientist Rachel Carson, who spearheaded the first environmental movement around the world. And in her book, Silent Spring, sought to scientifically prove how disregard for the use of chemical pesticides can harm both people and the environment. Excellencies, today's triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, coupled with the socioeconomic impacts related to the current geopolitical situations and the devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic require from us to work together across borders and sectors at all levels. The need to enhance science policy interface and to bring together all relevant stakeholders to consider how we can best harness the power of science, technology and innovation for sustainable development holds a prominent place also in the agenda of the UN Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, as the moderator has stated. ECOSOC recently convened its seventh annual multi-stakeholder forum on science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development goals, the STI forum, which was held in May. The STI forum provided a timely opportunity to identify solutions to a number of challenges the world is currently facing, ranging from the COVID-19 pandemic to the impacts of the artificial intelligence, education and technology gaps, and climate change. These crises have, without any doubt, reversed years of development progress in many countries, especially in Africa and the countries in special situations. The forum therefore highlighted science, technology, and innovation solutions to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs. There is an urgent need to ensure that all of our great United Nations efforts and the solutions emanating from the annual forums on science, technology, and innovation work in a coordinated fashion and support our shared efforts to achieve the SDGs. We have also worked towards ensuring that the STI Forum and other related events, such as the annual forum of the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development, supported by UNCTAD, build on each other to attain the same goal of achieving the SDGs. Excellencies, in this spirit of collaboration, I would also like to highlight the role of the United Nations Interagency Task Team on STI for the SDGs, which brings together over 40 UN entities. The task team is an integral part of the technology facilitation mechanism and a vital platform for the UN to enhance its collaborative work 
on these topics. During the STI Forum this year, the task team showcased its work streams on STI for SDG roadmaps, emerging science and technologies, capacity building, gender, as well as initiatives such as the Global Sustainable Technology and Innovation Community, the GSTIC, the Partnership in Action on STI for SDG Roadmaps, and International Science Council's International Network for Government Science Advice, the INGSA. This session presents a further building block to reiterate that humans are inextricably interconnected with nature and that they need both natural and man-made environment. It is also an opportunity to remind us of the principle 18 of the Stockholm 1972, which states, and I quote, science and technology as part of their contribution to economic and social development must be applied to the identification, avoidance, and control of environmental risks and the solution of environmental problems and for the common good of mankind, close quote. In other words, we need to use science and technology wisely to improve human well-being. This was true then in 1972, and it is still so today. We should, as countries, the UN system organizations and other entities and stakeholders, work together to use science and technology for our benefit and above all, support countries and peoples who are in vulnerable situations and who need assistance the most to profit from science and technology. Let us continue to strive to include scientific evidence and technology to inform our policies and strategies in order to recover sustainably from the COVID-19 pandemic and emerge into a better world where economic benefits are shared more equitably, societies are more inclusive, leaving no one behind, and where proper measures are undertaken to preserve the environment. This is what I have tried to promote during the ECOSOC presidency for the past year and what we are preparing for at the 2022 High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, the HLPF. I want to take this opportunity to invite you all to join us in New York in July to advance thinking on how best to overcome the crisis we are facing related to the environment, the food security, energy, and finance through the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the accelerated achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals during the remainder of the decade of action. This partnership with the UN Global Science and Business Forum does not end here this week. We will continue to collaborate further, including in New York during the HLPF. Let me conclude by indicating that I look forward to hearing your thoughts during this session on how we as a people, policymakers and innovators can make a difference, contributions that I will take to the HLPF in July. I want to thank you again for your very kind attention. Thank you. Uh, President Kelapile, uh, before, before I let you go, and in the, uh, the spirit of an open dialogue, I have a, a quick question I want to pose to you. We, we've talked a little bit about the SDGs and the challenges we face there. Uh, I spoke recently with Achim Steiner from UNDP on the Human Development Report, the Human Security Report, and the struggles that are being faced there. We look at uh, the, uh, the, the, the race to net zero, one and a half degrees. I imagine someone in your position needs to remain glass half full. Mm -hmm. what, what fuels, what drives your optimism? Well, I, I wouldn't say there is any single answer to that, but what I can say, I've just come from two particular regional forums. I was in Kigali in March. I just returned from Bangkok. Um, and listening to the member states, um, 
as you are aware, we are going to have 45 countries this year presenting their voluntary national reviews in July during the high-level political forum on sustainable development. Just listening to the commitment they still really carry in this very difficult time where we've had COVID-19 really reversing decades of development gains, shrinking the fiscal spaces that they all need to finance the SDGs. We have known that 2.5 trillion financing gap annually is not a small number. The situation has worsened, but what really motivates me listening to these countries is that irrespective of all that, irrespective of the current geopolitical difficulties, and irrespective of the continuing challenges of climate change, and irrespective of the fact that they do not have sufficient funding for the SDGs, but they are still determined to do their best uh, during the remainder of the decade of action. And it is that that fuels the optimism. Thank you very much indeed, President Kelohile. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Um, the, the most important scientific discovery of our time is one that presented irrefutable evidence that humanity has pushed Earth beyond the boundaries that have kept our planet stable for 10,000 years since the dawn of civilization. Professor uh, Johann Röckström has, uh, as I'm sure most of you here are aware, had the most profound impact on our understanding of the planetary thresholds that we must not exceed, not just for the stability of our planet, but the, for the future uh, of humanity. Uh, he has said, and I'm sure uh, most of you will remember this, humanity has now entered the decade that determines our future on Earth. I'm thrilled to welcome Professor Röschström to the forum to share his thoughts. He's kindly agreed, by the way, to take some of your questions after saying a few words. Uh, so I will open this up to you in a moment. Uh, Professor Röschström, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Your Excellencies, colleagues, friends. The scientific verdict after 50 years is clear. This is a gathering in Stockholm, a decisive gathering where we need to declare failure. After 500 plus multilateral environmental agreements, all the efforts that we've been making, we're still not bending the curves. We're still moving in a direction where we are now you know, 70 years into the Anthropocene, the new geological epoch where we, the modern human enterprise, is the dominating force of change on the entire planet. When Stockholm met in 1972, we were already 20 years into the Anthropocene. It was an early warning, but nobody at the time could imagine which science is today forced to put right at the center of the stage, namely the risk that we're destabilizing the entire life support system on Earth, that we are at risk of pushing the planet away from the livable Holocene condition we've had privilege of having since we left the last ice age 20,000 years ago, and that we are at risk of self-amplifying movement that would actually mean for the first time that we're meeting here in Stockholm, forced to consider the risk that we would be handing over to our children a planet that is less livable than the planet that we ourselves were born on. This destabilization risk of the planet has been highlighted so clearly just over the last few weeks when the World Meteorological Organization just two weeks ago declared that the latest climate science modeling shows that just over the next five years we have a 50-50% risk, a one in two chance of hitting 1.5. And this is so dramatic because you may be fully aware that the latest science shows unequivocally that past 1.5 and you go from moderate risk for humanity to high risk for humanity, even with risk of crossing tipping points. This means that 1.5 is not some kind of political arbitrary compromise. It's a scientific climate planetary boundary. Actually, we put 1.5 as the planetary boundary already in 2009. We're in the sixth mass extinction of species. We're undermining the living biosphere's capacity to support humanity and at a moment where we need a resilient biosphere more than ever, we have the weakest point of the planet when we're subject to the climate forcing. This is truly challenging. In 2009, when we published the first planetary boundary analysis, we assessed that four of the nine boundaries were outside of the safe operating space. It is climate change, 
biodiversity loss, land system change, and overloading of reactive nitrogen and phosphorus. I can share with you today that in two weeks' time we'll be submitting the third scientific update on the planetary boundary science, and unfortunately we show, which will come as no surprise to this audience of course, we're still moving in the wrong direction. The original four are deeper into the red, and we're adding two more boundaries outside of the safe operating space. Both the loading of novel entities, so all forms of microplastics, uh, you know, organic pollutants, pesticides, and, and antibiotics, all forms of chemicals, and that we're also outside of the safe space on fresh water, the very bloodstream of the Earth's system, which keeps the resilience of the system intact. A safe landing for humanity within the planetary boundaries is nothing less than an exponential transformative journey, and it's urgent. We have scientific support for Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General's statement that we are in code red. We have a planetary emergency. But it's not only about sustainability in environmental terms, it's about justice. It's about recognizing the fact that 10 years ago we had 80 million people s facing starvation. It's now over 160, and we're facing the risks of over 200 million people. Why? Because we have perfect storms starting to emerge in different fragile regions in the world. With climate change causing droughts and undermining food systems, particularly right now in the Horn of Africa, but also in India, colliding with the geopolitical turbulence with the Ukraine war, hitting energy prices and fertilizer prices. These are the kind of shocks that a fragile Earth system and fragile world has difficulties in dealing with. So we need to recognize that the poly crisis and the systemic risks we're facing are so much larger in scale, occurring so much more abruptly and intertwined socially and ecologically. Now is the time to really take on once and for all that the environmental challenges we have are not about the environment. They're about safety, security, prosperity, and equity. We must simply build in the understanding that taking care of the health of our planet is to taking care about the stability of our societies. 1972, the Limits to Growth Report was uh, submitted, a phenomenal accomplishment by the MIT team led by Dennis Meadows, Donella Meadows, and Jürgen Randers. It warned humanity that in the 2020s, if we continue business as usual, we are at risk of having a drawdown on the global economy because we're undermining the life support systems on Earth. Well, the limits to growth was an early warning. It was actually 30 years before the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, the IGBP, here in Sweden, at the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences, put forward the scientific synthesis that gave the proof that we are in the Anthropocene. We did not know that 50 years ago. The great acceleration that we're hitting the ceiling of the biophysical hardwired processes that regulates the stability of the Earth system. Stockholm 1972 was actually 45 years before the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. We did not have a science-based guideline to operate against, giving us a carbon budget, giving us the carbon law, giving us a net zero point for the world economy by 2050. Isn't that just wonderful that today we have not only the evidence, we have the quantifications and the guides for strong sustainability pathways. It is actually 33 years before the first planetary boundary scientific publications. What a, an accomplishment to be able to warn humanity at that early stage. Actually, it was 50 years before we were in serious discussions of a nature-positive, science-based target to be able to keep ourselves in balance with nature on planet Earth. So it's not only about soft speaking anymore. We know what to do. No, sorry. We know what is necessary to do for positive outcomes for humanity in the future. And we also have the turnarounds required. We know what kind of transitions are needed. We know what needs to come out of gatherings like this in Stockholm. An energy transition rapidly in one generation landing in a fossil fuel free driven world economy. We know that we need a food system transition towards healthy and sustainable food systems in order to keep the resilience and health of people in line. We know that we need to empower and educate, particularly girls across the most vulnerable regions in the world, to be able to have positive economic development. We need to have justice and fair wealth distribution, not allowing what we're doing today, which is just having a deep and deep and discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots. We have the agenda. We have the science. Now is the question to deliver. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Johan, and, and thank you for some super images as well on the screen. Some you know, pr pretty frightening. Uh, and some pretty heartbreaking as well. All right, look, let me, let me kick off a couple of questions and then I'll open it up to our audience. Um, did, did COP, did Glasgow, did Glasgow make you more or less cynical about our progress? I think Glasgow and COP26 was a progress. So no, it wasn't something that, that shot me down in, in cynicism. I think it's really positive that now all the negotiations are finished, the texts are in place. So now we can no longer blame um, that we need to spend a lot of time negotiating uh, the final, final print. Mm. Now is time to deliver. We have all the pledges, all the quantifications. You know, it's just remarkable with the methane pledge, the deforestation pledges. Over half of the world's countries actually have net zero pathways. Mm. So it's really about delivering on the nationally determined contributions. I fully respect that outside of the negotiating, uh, uh, you know, venues in Glasgow, there was a distrust, uh, will all these promises really translate to, to real action? Yeah. And I think that accountability is what I hope we will see in the future. Of course, that was pre-Ukraine, uh, um, pre the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You, you talked very briefly about the energy crisis. How, how much worse has that made the, the, the situation, the context? Uh, or do you see this as an opportunity that we really need to harness now? And can we do that in time? Mm. No, thanks. I'm a really, that's a really important question. And, and I, I think we need to keep two things um, um, you know, in focus at the same time. On the short term, there's no doubt that we are seeing you know, uh, a retraction, a pushback, uh, a tendency of putting a pause button on climate action, that the Ukraine war is, is causing short-term turbulence. You even see uh, reopening of carbon, uh, of coal-fired plants. Uh, th there is this, this risk of us backing off slightly on the really short term. But on the longer term, I'm absolutely convinced that the Ukraine war will be an accelerator on the pathway towards you know, independence from, from fossil fuel mm -hmm. sourcing. And the reason for this is obvious, that we're seeing that you know, the, the risks will, with too much fossil fuel dependency is not only about climate risks, it's also about the security and stability in the economies. Um, I mean, I live in Germany now. The German government is, is, is really working on both these levers, uh, recognizing on the short term it has massive impacts on the economy, but on the long term it rather will accelerate the pathway mm -hmm. to deliver on the phase out of dependence on, on gas, oil, and coal yep. from, from, in this case, totalitarian states. Okay, so, so reasons for optimism. And, and indeed, in your, in your new book, uh, there are other uh, uh, reasons for optimism. I think you mentioned in particular the, the, uh, the way we're tackling poverty globally. I think you mentioned uh, China's net zero commitments as, 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 as two things. Would you, similar question to President Kelapile, would you, are you glass half full right now? Do you have to be glass half full? I guess you do in your position. Well, <laughs> I, y y yes and no. I mean, it goes a little bit up, up and down, to be honest. But, but I think uh, but that there's never a reason to give up. But I think it's, it's quite interesting right now that uh, um, as we meet in Stockholm right at this moment, I think there is reason to be really deeply concerned. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's not looking good. At the same time, we have so much evidence that the investments in the sustainable future will give us multiple benefits in the other side. Mm. So there is this, this bumpy short term, while the long term will give us a, a, a not only a safer, but also a more prosperous and equitable future. So you know, th there's, there's all reason to, to keep up the momentum, but there is actually reason when we meet here to, to, to look at the, at the data and say, gee, we're still not bending that damn curve and we're having difficulties. I mean, soon we come to a point where we'll have to declare that we cannot make the 1.5. So yeah. I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't give you a, a thumbs up or thumbs down. I would rather say it's a some thumb <laughs> at, at the horizontal. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, me, let me take a couple of questions from the audience, if, if someone has a question in the audience. Uh, if you just put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, everyone's being a little... A little sh yes. Yes, Shireen. Right behind you. Um, scientists do not run the world. They inform, they urge, they raise awareness. But if they did, you know, run the world, 
what would be the three things that you would ordain necessary to do immediately? Mm. Well, to, to begin with, I, I think it's really good that scientists don't run the world. <laughs> um, but, um, but if I would be able to, uh, to guide some democratic elected leader who does run the world, I, I would say that the number one is, is uh, to put an end date on, on fossil fuel sourcing altogether and put that date at uh, somewhere between 2040 and 2050 and in so doing delete all uh, you know the, the over one trillion dollars of subsidies to fossil fuels and I would create a fund, a global investment fund to help all developing countries to compensate them in full for that, um, that loss they make because 60% of the fossil fuel resources are in developing countries. One has to recognize this, this enormous dependence for economic development. So that's number one. Number two, I would, um, you know, once and for all put, put a, a, a zero loss of nature clause for the world, meaning that we have transformed 50% of the world's land area into agriculture, infrastructure and cities. And I would say from now on, we need to keep the remaining intact nature and start to restore as much as we can, but particularly the, the halting, the loss. And again, make uh, the big custodians, particularly indigenous communities in the world, as stewards for those commons, these, these commons that they are, because we all depend on them, and, and invest in that and compensate for that. That would be my, my number two. And number three would really be to put, there comes the scientist, I guess, to put all investments in education. I mean, really, make every citizen have access to, to the latest knowledge on the fact that we are no longer this small world on a very big planet. We're now this big, big world on a very fragile small planet and that we have to take care of the whole system. And that this is something that every citizen in the world has a right to know. And, and I think with that knowledge, I think we become much more uh, engaged citizens and can also uh, express our rights. Do you have that little ball in your pocket right now? I hear you sometimes Ooh, carry a little ball yeah, representing I'm, I'm us in so your pocket. I'm so sad that I don't have it on <laughs> me right now, actually, because, yeah, there's different reasons for this. I'm, I've been okay. uh, also Airport security around. or something like that, we can put it down <laughs> to you. <laughs> All right. Any, anyone else? Uh, question for Johan. Yes, lady at the back. Hello. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Yoko Lu. I am part of the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Task Force. And I would like to know like, what is the perspective on the youth for the future generation and how the intergenerational equity really is fits into this perspective of yours and how all of the sectors are connected and how like, like the different generations can really help the youth will engage, especially across the South-South collaboration, and also between Global North and Global South. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. No, I, I would say that, um, and, and this is something that we're working on quite actively in something called the Earth Commission, which is an effort of trying to define a safe and just space for humanity, that the ultimate definition of justice, now that we're so deep into the Anthropocene, is, is every newborn human beings right for a stable, resilient, livable planet. That, that we've come to this point that we now have to uh, define um, justice in an intergenerational term with regards to sustaining the, the livability and stability of the whole planet. And, and that is, uh, I think, what, what the Fridays for Future uh, movement have fully understood. That we are at risk on the longer term to, to start drifting away from the conditions that have enabled us to thrive and, and therefore them also having the right to, to have a chance of thriving into the future. So I think that that's one, one element of that intergenerational justice. The second one, of course, and I know that some of you are, are economists in the, in the room, I think it's uh, uh, the moment we, we adopt more kind of strong sustainability measures in economics, meaning that you have to respect scientifically defined boundaries which gives us absolute budgets to share in a fair way, mm. that kind of uh, pulls the rug away <coughs> from all forms of, um, of discounting, that you can, you can no longer discount the future because suddenly the future becomes equally valued as the present. 
or even more valued. Mm -hmm. so, so I think uh, all forms of science that gives us the 1.5 targets, that gives us net uh, zero loss of nature, or the nature positive, the planetary boundaries, we're moving in this direction. And I think this helps intergenerational justice because it, it puts security fencing around the life support systems, both the living and the physical ones. Yep, okay, I've got time for one more very quick question if someone has one. Yeah, gentleman right there. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Ah, there we go. Um, Jarvis Smith, media owner in the UK. Um, science, I have no disrespect for it at all. It's amazing, it's brilliant, particularly the work that you've done. But there does seem to be a level of arrogance and ignorance amongst humanity that we are more clever than nature. So historically, the indigenous have treated nature as a conscious living being. It's been around much longer than humanity and will probably be around much longer than we are. So with your incredible knowledge in science, how far do you think behind science is in comparison to the wisdom and intelligence of nature and nature to be able to fix the very problem that we have if we're able to get out of the way? Mm. Yeah, Josh, I think this is, that's a very, very important uh, reflection, I would say, partly the question. I mean, we, we know that, that indigenous communities around the world are not only the best, but profoundly anchored in the stewardship of nature in, in ways that we have to learn from. Uh, the challenge we have, of course, is that we're running out of time and we need to you know, really, really connect with not only nature, but also with the knowledge base that is represented by indigenous communities across the Earth system. I mean, from the Inuit in, on Greenland to, to the indigenous communities in the rainforest systems, all the way down to the desert ecosystems. And, and this is um, something that we have uh, allowed ourselves to do that enormous mistake of disconnecting the modern development from nature and disconnecting ourselves from, from the indigenous knowledge base. I think the UN here has been doing quite a lot of advancements. Uh, just look at the transition from the early work of the IPCC in the 1990s to the IPBS work today, which is much more anchored around different knowledge systems as inputs to guide science-based target setting and developments to, to, to be managing nature. So I think we are, you know, we're, we're gradually really moving in the right direction here, but, but, but your point is, is, is so well taken. Okay, Johan, look, we thank you very much indeed for your insights and your yeah. candor as well today. Thank you very Thank much, you. Johan Rockström. And thanks for your questions as well, by the way.